vassals. Who doesn't love them? So, you're expanding. You run out of admin to call your new lands. But no worries, you can release a vassal. A little buddy to run around, abandon sieges on 49%, overstack your battles, or even pretend to reinforce those same crucial battles, and then change his mind at the last minute. These things are wonderful. Many people have attempted to harness their power to the full potential, with some playing as Ashikaga in the east, with a personal swarm of Japanese OPMs. And another option for these kinds of vassal builds is turning Germany into your own personal vassal fiefdom, through the Roke and the HRE. All wonderful strategies that can be used to great effect, but we are here at the Lemon Kick channel. Hence, we are here to push these all to their limits. Namely, can we get ourselves to a point where we can get more force limit from a vassal owning a province than if we were to own it ourselves? If that would happen, assuming we have a way of giving ourselves an unlimited amount of vassals, which spoilers, for the most part we will, and also assuming we make enough money to actually afford all of this, can we turn our land into a rich tapestry of OPM vassals all having their own mini stacks of troops, or we make force them at bank from their existence. In fact, one could say this is only the beginning. Military hegemon enforcement is going to seem small with where we're going. Disclaimers! Unlike other modified stacking runs where I go straight into the only theoretically doable over the top run, today I'm also going to be including a budget version of this modified stacking run that should be at least reasonably doable by the average player. Now, of course, definitions of what the average player and what I can see to be the average player versus what you see the average player as is going to vary. This is not going to be an easy run by any stretch of the imagination as well. So do be prepared for some challenge, but it's a run that should be at least doable uh, compared to some of the more theoretical things where I'm asking for 50 tank switches. With that said, the usual limitations of standard setup, no custom nations, I'm incompatible and achievement compatibility will of course be as forced as always. And with all those disclaimers out the way, let's go. Now, for this video, even more than normal, I think it's important that we're all on the same page with how Vassal Force Limit Contribution actually works. If you have an in-depth understanding on the actual by-the-numbers rate of how Vassals contribute Force Limit, feel free to skip to the timestamp listed here on screen now. If you don't, however, feel free to stick around for a very short guide with how Vassal Force Limit actually works. Right, if you're here, I'm assuming you're here for the guide, so let's get going. All vassals will give you plus one force limit base, regardless of their size, as well as 10% of their force limit to your overlord, in this case you. What that means is, is if you have a vassal of something like France, they're going to give you 10% of their force limit, and then plus one force limit for existing. If you have a vassal of, say, Dutmartian, which is just one province, they're going to give you that same plus one base force limit, as well as 10% of their current force limit. Now, it's an important distinction here, is it's 10% of current force limit. If the vassal takes something like quantity ideas, which will increase their force limit by 33%, you're going to see that 33% increase in force limit reflected by their 10% contribution. It's not 10% of their base force limit, it's 10% of their total force limit. So, there we go. That's vassals, what they give you force limit wise by default. If you then go ahead and take something like influence ideas, which contains martial laws for plus 100% vassal force limit contribution, what they're going to do is it's going to increase both the plus one base vassal force limit contribution as well as the percentage of force limit they're sending you. So in the case of vassal, that 100% increase is going to make you go from plus one base force limit to plus two and from 10% vassal force limit contribution to 20% vassal force limit contribution. If we then stack it to say 300%, we will now be, the, our normal vassal will now be sending us four force limit and we will be now getting 40% of their force limit contribution instead of 10%. So far, so good. Now, vassals aren't the only type of vassal. We then move on to our next type of vassal, marchers. Marchers are going to give us the same plus one vassal force limit for existing as before. That's a given, but marchers give you 20% of their force limit, not 10%. This is an important distinction because it stacks really well with the percentage modifier stacking in our case, as the 20% vassal force limit contribution means that when we stack to say the same 300% vassal force limit contribution modifier, um, that we have in our game, we're now getting 80% vassal force limit, of the, well, 80% of their force limit instead of 40%, as we've, in essence, doubled our base amount of vassal force limit contribution. So marchers are significantly better than vassals, in this case, for force limit stacking. However, if we take a look at the base amount, we're still going from 1 to 4, so that remains unchanged. 
Now we need to move on to the third type of vassal that we'll be covering in this video, and that's the colonial nations. Now, colonial nations, there's different types of them, and they're also dependent if they count as a large colonial nation, as in if they have more than 10 or more provinces. If they're a large colonial nation and they're a crown colony, which is the only kind of a colonial nation we'll be taking a look at in this video, since it's the best one for vassal force make contribution, we're going to be getting a base plus 5 land force summit and 10 naval force summit from them. We're going to disregard the naval force summit. We're going to get 5 base, base land force summit from them. And we're going to get 30% of their land force summit when they're a crown colony. Now this is obviously quite strong. That plus 5 land force summit contribution is going to be going to plus 10 land force summit contribution with plus 100%. And 30% of their force summit contribution is again going to be doubled to 60% force summit contribution. This naturally can be getting very quickly out of hand. If you have a colonial game, I'd actually recommend getting a bit of Vassal Modify stack and going yourself in just a normal game. Because it can be quite powerful just to get a lot more force summit out of your vassals. And more specifically out of your colonies as well. This means that actually in most colonial games, I'd recommend you pick up influence or at least a couple other things to get a bit more vassal force summit contribution since you have these absolutely massive vassals and when you make them your, your well, crown colonies, you can get a very impressive amount of force summit out of them. And hence, from just a general gameplay point of view, things like influence ideas are really not bad for a colonizer. But that should be enough information for the rest of the video. Thank you very much for watching the guide and I'll see you in a sec. Right, hello. Now let's move on to the counter. We're going to be having a rather complicated counter today. So if you see something here you don't understand, feel free to go back to the guide. It's going to pretty much cover it. Anyway, there's the counter. Oh lord, there's a lot of things going on. This is the most advanced counter yet. So to celebrate, feel free to head down below and increase the light counter as well as the sub counter if you haven't already. I know it's not as fancy as the counter we have today, but given the scale of this one, sometimes it's the simple things that matter the most. Anyway, enough selling out. Let's look at the first doable at-home build that we'll be covering today. Now this build I've affectionately dubbed the African Colonial Vassal Horde, or the ACVH for short. You don't actually stay as a horde, but you're going to spend a significant part of it as a horde, and hence the name W. If you disagree with the name, f fair enough, you can go, go do that, but you can't change the video I've already recorded, so shame. You can disagree in the comments though, nothing stopping you doing that. Anyway, with that aside, let's get into the actual run itself. What you're looking for in terms of the assigned country is someone in this area that has access to the tribal government reforms. I've selected Air, and the reason I've done that is because they also start as Sunni. We're going to need, if we don't start as Sunni, or, well, if we don't start as Sunni, basically, we're going to need to find a way to flip into Sunni ourselves, as we're going to need, well, Sunni later for a form. So with that said and done, let's go ahead and get into Air itself. Now, as heir, we do start as a tribal despotism at our tier 1 reforms. That gives us access to the tribal reforms, which is excellent since we need to take the become a horde reform. So go ahead and go towards that. Obviously, take the actual reforms that you want to use in your run. It's going to be up to you and become a horde. Now, as you're doing this, this is going to be your early game. It's just going to be consolidating this area and catching up on tech. Bear in mind, you start without feudalism, so you're going to be behind in that regard. You also start with a pretty pathetic economy. I mean, I've just become a horde, so obviously it's got a slightly worse as well technically but let's just say you can't really afford your capital for it so with that being said and done just bear in mind that you have a rather weak net country as you're starting with there's not many stronger countries in this area so just build up your country get yourself to a point where you're pretty much functioning at least have a bit of income going for you and go reform into a horde while having this area on lockdown now as you are a horde you also have access to horde ideas so let's start taking a look at our ideas now so with that said, and with no surprises to anyone involved, let's go fill out our first idea group, all ideas. Now, these are going to help you early game somewhat as well, because they're going to make your cavalry a lot cheaper, which you'll be using a lot of since you're a horde. They're going to give you cavalry combat ability, and they're just, in general, a nice idea group for being a horde. No complaints there. Now, as you've got hard ideas filled out, you should probably be looking at around admin tech 7 by the time you want to be looking north. What I mean by this is going into the Morocco, Clements, and Tafeld area, or going to the Tunis area. You're hoping that Tunis either colonizes these two provinces from their missions, or Morocco colonizes this province through their missions as well. If none of these things happen, and you're at Admin Tech 7, you're prepared to go further, what I would recommend is you grab something like Expansion Ideas and grab the first colonist for plus one colonist, so that you can, well, colonize one, either these two provinces or this one. Ideally with the colonists, you just colonize this one, so you can start going into Morocco itself. The whole point is to arrive basically at Soita or wherever the Europeans are at this point in their conquest into Africa and then both drive them from Africa and start going into Andalusia yourself. Now obviously it's a lot easier for me to demonstrate that it's going to be for you but you're going to need to get into to, well mainland Castile 
At this point you've probably committed a lot to your army, but probably don't have that much committed to your navy, so you're going to have a really hard time crossing here. What I would recommend is if you are happy to choose it without wanting to invest too much in navy is that you can get military access or ally summons such as France or Portugal or anyone else in the, or nearby to them where you can park your armies and then use them as a launch pad for your invasion. This is a valid strategy to use and basically allows you to bypass this uh, without having to ask military access through everyone in the Balkans, Italy and, well, Egypt to actually get there. So that is a valid strategy if you want to go that way. Otherwise, go ahead and get yourself into Iberia, and once you're there, you can go ahead and accept Andalusian and become Andalusian primary culture. The whole point of this, of course, is that we're going to be forming Andalusia later, but before we do, we have a couple other more housekeeping things to get out of the way. See, if we were to form Andalusia right away, we won't be able to, since we are currently a nomad nation and a tribe, so you'd get rid of that. Uh, but before we do, forming Andalusia is going to give us a free flip into a monarchy. Which means we can abuse this to go ahead and get the Republic government reform and then flip out of it in essence for free so that we can get the Republic unique idea set associated with it, Plutocratic. So with that being said and done, let's go back to our ideas. So at our ideas, at tier 2, in a weird fashion I'm actually going to recommend you take economic ideas. They're going to help you financially with your board troubles, but more importantly they're going to give you access to a policy. That gives you plus 33% raised power gain and plus one yearly horde unity, which is going to help you a lot in terms of your actual playing around as a horde build-up, I find, as that raised in power gain is going to, well, give you a lot of mana to play with. Furthermore, we're going to need economic anyway, so there's no things that we lose harm-wise from picking up economic now. Right, in terms of our government reforms though, you need to go ahead and after that point, flip away from becoming a horde into becoming a reforming into a republic. Now, make sure you don't enact any reforms from this public stuff away right away. You, you don't want to touch that. The reason is, is that the moment you reform into a republic, you should go ahead and take plutocratic ideas. You don't have to fill them out, just take them. And then immediately, you can go ahead and restore or land loose. What this is going to do is it's going to give you the Ictar government reform, uh, the Al Andalus Sultanate, sorry, not the Ictar government reform. But more importantly, that's going to lock you straight back into a monarchy without needing to spend more stability from reforming your government. This also means that even though you have plutocratic selected now, you'll be able to go ahead and get aristocratic ideas next. Well, not next, since we need another non mill idea group. But with that said and done, now that we've formed Andalusia, make sure you also take their ideas, as we are doing it for the plus 100% vassal force move contribution, which is actually the first vassal force move contribution of the run that we added to the counter, the uh, Typha administration. Excellent. Right, with that being said and done, let's go back to our ideas. So as naturally said at this point, go ahead and fill out plutocratic. And after you have plutocratic filled out, you can go ahead and grab influence. Now at this point of the campaign, I'm assuming you've already quite established into the, both Iberia and this area, so you should be able to grab a bunch of vassals and colonial nations, more importantly, from a lot of the colonizers. So that's Castile that you're killing, Portugal that you're killing, and potentially have access to both England and France somewhat, although England having access to them is never an easy thing to do. But you still have an opportunity to fight them, especially France if they end up colonizing, to grab their colonies, and you have access to the Portuguese and Spanish colonies who almost always tend to colonize as well. Therefore, with those two colonial powers that you just basically defeated, you should have picked up a couple of their colonies, and hence something like influence ideas by the fourth idea group is going to be working very nicely for you, as you are now going to have 200% loss of force limit out of those colonies. But again, we're stacking them here, so let's keep going. You're going to want to, after you take influence, go ahead and take aristocratic ideas. Now after aristocratic ideas you can take any idea group from both admin or dip, so this one I'm going to leave up to you. But if I'm allowed a recommendation, I'm going to recommend that you actually go ahead and pick up exploration ideas. Exploration ideas has a lot of utility you can use, like fabricating claims in overseas colonial regions, giving you an extra corners to fill out a lot of the areas, giving you access to a reform later, giving you some global settlers to help, well, colonize and expand your colonial nations, as well as some more colonial range and buffs like that. So in this case, I would suggest exploration ideas, but if you don't want to, you don't need them. Exploration ideas are not part of the run, it's just the fact that we have too many mill groups and we need to take another mill group after this, and we can't take another mill group if we have not enough admin and dip groups. So there we go, that's exploration ideas sorted. Let's go ahead and go to our final idea, which is going to be mercenary ideas. With that said and done, now we can go ahead and look at our policies. So in our policies, the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and grab the Vassal Obligation Act, which is going to give us Vassal Force and the Contribution plus 100%, as well as a Dip Relation slot, which we can't complain about. Then we need to go ahead and go to our Dip and get the Client State Act, which is going to give us Vassal Force and the Contribution 50%, as well as give us the ability to create Client States. 
And at this point, we've got 150% Vassal Forcement without any Mill Idea Groups. But now let's talk about some Mill Idea Groups. Harash is going to give us 5 Morale of Armies and 100 Vassal Forcement Contribution. Unified Army Command is going to give us another 100% Vassal Forcement Contribution, as well as decreased Limited Design Subjects by 10%. And finally, Autonomous Estates is going to give us plus 5 Estate Loyalty Equilibrium, which is never bad, but it's also going to give us 100% Vassal Forcement Contribution. With that said and done, we now have 450% Vassal Forcement Contribution from our policies. But we're strictly speaking not done, there's still one other last thing we can pick up. See, we have our government reforms to go in. So at tier 2, we can take whatever. I'm going to strengthen noble privileges as always. But at tier 3, we have access to representatives of the crown. Normally, I see most people still taking either centralizing the monarchical core bureaucracy or decentralizing it, which is fair, those two are quite powerful. But you should consider the opposite options. After all, regional councils is quite powerful in the early game for the local tax modifier. In our case, however, we're going to be taking representatives of the crown. That's just going to make our vassals slightly richer in terms of national tax modifier. But most importantly, it's going to give us another 25% vassal force of contribution. And that, actually, for the most part, is going to conclude our run. Obviously, we can take a lot more government reform, there's nothing too specific there. And I suggested economic idea, um, not economic ideas, exploration ideas, so that you can go ahead and take the exploitation of the new world reform. It's going to give you an extra colonist, as well as give your colonial subjects 10 goods produced, which is going to make you a lot of money. Um, but again, all of the other reforms are going to be up to you and your playstyle. I can only make recommendations. None of them are necessary, as it were, for the run. With that all said and done, that is going to give us a rather impressive Vassal Force Summit contribution. If we take a look at it now, we'll be looking at a Vassal Force Summit contribution of 675%. In fact, the optimal version of this run only improves us to 775%, but it does a couple other things to get, let's just say, a couple more Vassals. After all, this run, for the most part, does not give you an unlimited amount of Vassal slots. So the only thing that you'll be really abusing is the fact that you should, well, conquer the entire New World and use that for Force Summit. You can still mess around with some client states, but you're going to very quickly run out of deep relation slots. Naturally, you have a lot of them. You can have access to a lot more diplomatic relation slots than you normally would. You get seven. However, it's not like seven vassals is an unlimited amount of diplomatic relations. Well, you end up going to nine if you do the strong duchies as well. But again, nine vassals is nowhere near as the amount we should be getting in our over-the-top run. Right, that concludes the African Colonial Vassal Horde. Now let's move on to our extreme over the top version of this run. And in the weirdest way possible, do the exact same thing you've just done, but hold off on forming Andalusia. You are going to go into a republic and then flip out of republic into a monarchy, so that's going to cost you more gun reform progress growth, but that's going to be it. You're pretty much doing the same air into Andalusia build that you're doing so far. We're just going to do a couple other things on our way there. As you're going into Andalusia, also go ahead and head over into Egypt. While you're doing that, you need to, even though you're starting as Sunni, you, can, you need to go ahead and flip into Catholic or whatever the HRE believes in these days. This also means that you don't actually need to start as heir if you want to start as someone fetishist or another country here for fun, or you want to start as Dahomey and pick up the Dahom Dahomey achievement, or whatever else, well, that's all sort of fine, all up to you. Point being is you need to go ahead and flip Catholic and you need to go ahead and become the emperor of the HRE. The point of the HRE, of course, we're going to want to start getting all of these reforms sorted because we want to be looking at revoking the privilege as soon as possible. Well, not quite as soon as possible. In fact, we should probably hold off on it until we've done the full preparation. As we're setting up to revoke the HRE, we need to go ahead and, as we've gone into Egypt, keep going further into Persia and go into India and get ready to form a very interesting tag. We can need to form Rajasthan. Now, Rajasthan is not an end tag and it's a formable. And the whole point of forming it is not for the ideas or anything weird like that. No, we're forming it because the tag changes our tag group to Indian nerd, to the Indian tag group. It's one of the few things that change. This is one of the few formals that actually changes your tech group, and hence we'll be forming it to well change our tech group. As after we've changed our tech group to Indian, we're able to gain access to another reform. After we also change our primary culture. But before you change your primary culture into the final one for the reform, I'd recommend you change your primary culture back into Andalusian and form Andalusia. So you have that going for you. You don't need to well do anything in that regard. And this will also flip you back to a monarchy. And after you formed Andalusia, which requires you flipping back into Sunni. You need to go ahead and change your primary culture into either the Dravidian culture group or into Oriya or Sinhalese. This is going to give you access, so you need to one reform the, 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 the system. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce that. That is an incredible name, but I can't pronounce that. This is going to give you access to 15% national manpower, but most importantly, another 100% vassal force of contribution. So go ahead and grab that. That actually completes the modifier stacking. That is going to be 775% vassal force of contribution. 
which is pretty much the peak that you can get. But of course, it's not about the vassal forcing contribution as it is about the actual vassals you can have. And this is where the HRE comes in. Now, you need to add pretty much as much of the uh, as much of Europe into the HRE as possible. And this is the part where it's going to be up to you. Balkanize this thing. And I do mean balkanize it. Go to people like Brandenburg and punch Rupin out of them. Go to people like Brunswick and punch out Kallenberg from them. Just make this the most over-the-top of Voltaire's Nightmare-esque um, representation of anything. And don't just stop at Europe. Go into France as well, go into Hungary, go into Croatia, go into Bosnia, all these areas. I mean, you think uh, Serbia is too big? Fair enough. Push out Montenegro. Croatia has Dalmatia to pop out and other fun things like that. Just get as many tags in as humanly possible. We're going to want to be abusing as many of the base vassal forcement contributions as possible as well here. But don't worry if you miss some. Because, for example, let's say we take a look at Brittany. Brittany contains five promises. The issue is very culturally homogenous and no tags or revolt tags in this area. This is all just Brittany as deep down as it goes. However, this is where our client states come in. As we have already gone Andalusia, we have access to the mercenary ideas with influence. So we have access to the um, client state act, allowing us to create client states. This means that what we do is we annex this entire area. Then we release four client states, sorry, create four client states in these four provinces. And then we release Brittany. This creates us Brittany plus four other provinces for us to enjoy as vassals that are all separate to each other. After you've balkanized the country sufficiently and created vassal spams, you should create you should convert all of them into marches. Now, at this point you'll be wondering how is this going to work in terms of our deprivation slots? Well, if you revoke the privilege, every vassal that's inside the Holy Roman Empire or is a prince of the Holy Roman Empire is not going to cost you a deprivation slot. That means your hyper-balkanized Balkans or hyper-balkanized entirety of Europe is going to be not costing you any deprivations at all. The other thing to bear in mind is every single one of these tags is going to do something very terrifying. No, not going to send 3k stacks to help your armies fight, although they're going to do that as well. They're going to dev. And that's the thing, when they're no PM country, they have pretty much nothing else to spend their mana on. They're not expanding, they're not taking that many new ideas, they're not taking that many techs. So they're going to take all your techs ahead of time, giving you a constant reduction in your tech cost. But most crucially, they're going to pretty much dev every single promise they own to 30, 40, 50 development. You're not going to be able to do that. They will because they have their own mana pool. So even with that plus 50% dev cost, you're going to have an entire just horde of Constantinople's and cities of the world desire by the end game. Pretty much every single one of these promises is going to be 30 up to 40 development. And if you don't believe me, look at anything that the AI gets up to if it's been stuck on Holland as for the entire campaign. AIs love to just AFK on Holland pretty much for a campaign. And if you are playing in Asia and then take a look at this three province Holland or wherever you're taking up taking a look at, you'll see 50 dev on pretty much every province without question. This means that the vast force limit they contribute to you is going to be based upon a very large force limit from that OPM, since that one province itself is going to have like 50 development, which is going to be even better in our case. Furthermore, they're all going to be marches. So I created Rousselion here as our little march so that we can demonstrate that with influence ideas, we can also designate them to be a special Rousselion march. Now, marches, just for being a march, are going to get a bunch of buffs. If we create another one real quick, just to demonstrate. Oh. Yeah, create another one. There we go. And we designate them a march. They're going to get all of these very nice buffs, including notice 30% land force cement modify, which you're going to get back out of them, I'm just not going to include it as our modifier stacking, we're going to be getting that out of our marches, because they're probably not going to be 25% of our development, but most crucially, with those marches, we can go ahead to them and we can send officers to get plus 5 discipline and 20% morale of armies. That means that, even without taking too many quantity quality ideas, we're going to get a very impressive morale of armies and discipline buff on top of their already present modifiers, so their little stacks that they send, which are going to be almost 10 to 15k now, aren't even going to be that bad for our fighting purposes. And most crucially, we're going to be getting an insane amount of force in the front. I mean, just to be clear here, Rousselion itself is already giving us almost 14 force limit with what, an eight development province? Y yeah, that's, that's the theme. So bear in mind, we're gonna be having like a swarm of these, they're gonna be all on like 30 dev, and we'll be able to go ahead and build the uh, conscription centers on them as well. Most importantly, on top of this, with the fact that we've got conscription centers on them, is the fact that we're going to have 775% vast force, so even more than we have here in this main demonstration. So this number is going to go shooting through the roof in no time. 
Because let's take a look at how much insane force we're actually getting from each vassal. The base force we're getting from each vassal has now gone to 8.75, which is absolutely insane. And our colonies are now giving us an a equally insane 43.75 bit force limit, just if they have 10 provinces. Furthermore, every one force limit of a normal vassal would give us 87.5% of that force limit. That means that even we technically do still lose force limit on a normal vassal, but these aren't normal vassals. They're marches. Pretty much every single one of our vassals should be a march, or there should be a colonial nation, which means our marches are going to be giving us 175% of their force limit. That means that if we build a plus two regimental camp that I previously mentioned on each one, we'll be getting 3.5 force limit out of that territory, out of that regimental camp, instead of the two if we were to own that camp ourselves. Crown colonies, however, really demolished the competition here, with 262% of 262.5% of their force limit becoming our force limit. So we are looking at a plus two building being built inside them, giving us 5.25 base force limit. And the best part is. The force limit we're gaining from our subjects in this manner is base force limit. So things like trading in grain would actually give you an extra 20% force limit on top of what you already see here. With that all being said and done, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.